Thank you, Gary. Um, my choice of topic today is a little unusual. It's quantum mechanics and its connection with gravity. But not, qu not the machinery of quantum mechanics, not how do you solve a certain Hamiltonian or uh, how do you calculate some entanglement entropy. I, wanna, I mean the foundations of quantum mechanics, the uh, interpretation, the things that they warn you in graduate school don't get involved in because it's dangerous, it'll ruin your mind. <laughs> what will happen to you is what happened to Einstein or something like that. And um, my, I, I always pretty much had that view of it, that uh, it was Feynman's view largely. Feynman's view was quantum mechanics is so confusing and the problem of the interpretation of quantum mechanics is so hard that it's just hard to tell if there's any problem. And the damn thing works, so let's just use it. I have to say that was always my feeling about it also. Uh, put it on the side, don't worry about it. The last two years or so have made me feel a little bit different about it. And the reason is one particular thing, one particular um, so we call it discovery or a uh, development. I was involved in it, and it's the ER equals EPR connection. That made me think that there are deep things going on at the level of the interpretation of quantum mechanics or the foundations of quantum mechanics that will not be understood until we understand quantum gravity. Um, if I can give you any sense that something like that may be true and that it's worth thinking about interpretive questions of quantum mechanics and how they connect with questions of gravity, I will have done my job here. So let's, um, who set this up? I have no idea what to do with it now. Log in. Log in. Yeah, log in. Okay. Thank you. Two, three, three, four, three. Now, we want to get slideshow, right? Current slide. Current slide. Anybody got any idea what that is? <laughs> Jonathan, why don't you tell me what it is? <laughs> Um, quantum mechanics is non-local in some funny way. Let me just tell you very quickly in what sense it is non-local. Of course, it doesn't mean you can send in information faster than the speed of light or anything like that. Quantum mechanics is non-local when you try to think about simulating it on classical machines. If you were to, for example, fill up space with lots of classical machines, meaning machines mean computers, and um, try to program them you're even allowed to interconnect them locally, ones next to each other, and you tried to fool somebody, the operator of the system, into thinking that the system really contained quantum objects and that uh, you were making measurements and performing operations on the quantum system. Um, you would find that you would fail unless you allowed non-local connections between the classical computers. And one very easy way to see that is that in order to encode entangled information, you would have to have some kind of central processor encoding entangled wave functions, and, those were, and that central processor would have to be able to communicate instantly with everywhere in order to be able to actually. Now, that doesn't mean that quantum mechanics is really non-local. It means that attempting to simulate it is non-local. Uh, why did I, oh, the only reason I pointed that out is to tell you what that picture was. It plays no role in the rest of the talk. <laughs> All right, the title of this talk originally was three short seminars with no conclusions. I'll probably lie a little bit and try to make some conclusion at the end. And the three short seminars are ER equals EPR and the Everett Copenhagen uh, interpretation, the Everett versus Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, or something I call GHZ brains. The second little talk is teleportation through the wormhole. Can you, can you teleport things through a wormhole? The answer turns out to be yes. And the last one is two slits in a wormhole, something about the two slit experiment. So doing very elementary things. Okay, quantum mechanics allows a certain kind of non-local connectivity. 
It's called entanglement. Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, entanglement. This is just a uh, cartoon picture of two very, very distant particles. They're distant if you go around in the outer, in, in space. I folded the space over just to make these two points close to each other, but they're really very far. And this is a cartoon representation of two entangled particles. And the line here represents nothing more than the fact that they're entangled. So quantum mechanics allows that kind of uh, non-locality that we associate with entanglement. General relativity allows another kind of non-local connectivity, the existence of classical solutions, which are called Einstein-Rosen bridges. Einstein-Rosen bridges, as I said, are classical solutions. And again, they can connect very, very distant regions. In both cases, incidentally, but in particular in the Einstein-Rosen case, Einstein, uh, Rosen, the, the, sorry, the Einstein-Rosen bridge case, but also for ordinary entanglement, observers outside cannot communicate with each other through the wormhole, but what they can do is they can send things into the wormhole from either side that can meet in the center. So while communication from the outside makes no sense, that's the non-traversability of classical wormholes. It is possible under certain circumstances, certain circumstances that may have to be engineered and it may even be hard to engineer them, but two people can jump in and test whether there was a wormhole there by jumping in and discovering each other. Alice and Bob can discover each other. They say, we know there was a wormhole there. It's a cold comfort because they'll soon die at the singularity, but Never mind, they've done a little experiment that tells them there was a wormhole. All right, the punchline of the ER equals EPR joke is that ER and EPR may really be, in some sense, the same thing. Uh, in what sense are they the same thing? Well, that's the first thing I want to talk about a little bit. In what sense may they be the same thing? And how far should we expect to be able to push this idea? Uh, JM stands for Juan Maldesaner, and LS stands for myself. Um, first of all, I, I assert, now I think most of you who studied uh, both black holes, particularly in anti de Sitter space, recognize this and would probably largely agree with it. Entangled black, well, let's start with this one. Black holes connected by Einstein-Rosen bridges are entangled. I think probably 95% of the community of people who've thought about two-sided black holes and things would agree that black holes connected by Einstein-Rosen bridges must be entangled. On the other hand, go a little bit further, and this is the converse statement, and I will assume it, that entangled black holes always have some form of Einstein-Rosen bridge between them. These are converses of each other, and I'm going to assume they're both true. Which is sensitive to how they are entangled. I don't think it's sensitive to how they're entangled, but I think what is sensitive is the character of the nature of the geometry inside the, uh, the um, but we'll, we'll talk about what it means. All right. um, okay, what about objects like elementary particles, entangled elementary particles? Is there any sense in which there is a wormhole between them? I don't know. Maybe someday there will be a notion of quantum geometry in which this thing makes sense down to the single qubit level, well, the single qubit or the entangled qubit level, but at least until the last part of the lecture, I will not assume that. I will assume ER equals EPR for black holes. Okay, so what is the meaning of it? Um, I will take the meaning of it to be that entanglement is a fungible resource. Now, I didn't know what the word fungible was uh, until uh, about uh, a month ago. Uh, resource, I know what that means. A useful thing for doing things. In this case, the useful thing for doing things, it's useful for communi communication, such things as quantum teleportation and so forth. What does fungible mean? Fungible here is the key point, that it's, it can be, its form can be changed. Energy is a fungible resource. It can go from electrical energy to chemical energy to mechanical energy to potential energy, blah, 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 blah. And you can always go back and forth between them. So that's what fungible means. Here's some forms of entanglement. Oh, one other thing. Is entanglement conserved like energy? Not in general, but if you have two distant systems which are too far away to communicate or interact with each other, and all you're allowed to do is local operations on each side, 
then it's, in, then it's conserved. So the entanglement between two distant systems is conserved, and in that sense it's conserved as a resource. Okay, so what forms? There's ground state entanglement. Everybody in this room is probably calculating ground state entanglement of something or other, some quantum field theory or other. There's entangled particles. I will add to the list now. Einstein, Rosen, Bridges. Einstein, Rosen, Bridges, that's, uh, that's the meaning here of VR equals EPR, that it is one of the kinds of entanglements that can be traded back and forth for each other, with each other. In the fourth part of the lecture, no, in the third part of the lecture, I will give you one more form of entanglement. Okay, let's start with vacuum entanglement. I just want to show you, you can go back and forth between them. Vacuum entanglement means, uh, just simply stated, virtual pairs can be um, produced in the vacuum, and the virtual pairs will generally be entangled. If you scatter particles off the virtual pair, scatter real particles off the virtual pair, the entanglement can easily be transformed to the real particles. This thing just becomes a Feynman diagram in which two unentangled particles come in, interact, and go out entangled. But you can also think of it as a transfer of the entanglement here to the, uh, to the particles. Let's suppose that Alice and Bob have made a bunch of entangled particles somehow, perhaps from the vacuum. So Bob and Alice now have a lot of entangled particles. Bob has his share, Alice has her share, and uh, the shares consist each, in each case, of half of the bell pairs. Bell pairs, imagining bell pairs. All right, we separate them, they go far from each other, as far as you like, and then Bob takes his particles, Alice takes her particles, and squeezes them together until they form two black holes. Maybe gravity squeezes them together, and they form two black holes, the, the idea of ER equals EPR is that that creates something which has some form of wormhole between them. Now, how can they test whether there's a wormhole? They can jump in and see if they find each other. Well, generally they won't find each other. Generally that won't work. But there are operations that they can do on the two sides that can convert them back to a configuration where, which is still entangled, where they can jump in and find each other. That's an assumption. That's an assumption that there are unitary operations, local unitary operations on either side that will convert the entangled state to some particular form which allows, which is smooth enough to allow, uh, to allow them to discover each other. All right, here's some, what, what can they do from there? Well, Bob can seal his black hole in a box, prevent it from evaporating. Alice can let her evaporate. This is just supposed to be a cloud of, a cloud of particles here. This cloud of particles are the result of uh, Alice allowing her, part, her black hole to evaporate. And then we have entanglement between the black hole and the cloud of particles. Both clouds of particles, both black holes can evaporate. And then we have two clouds of particles. In fact, when that happens, when that happens, what you get is a big cloud of particles which is so thoroughly scrambled up that no matter which way you slice it or cut it, you'll find that it's extremely highly entangled. Well, you can go from this by operations on the two sides, local operations on the two sides, you can readjust and get back to the Alice-Bob sharing bell pairs. So these are all forms of entanglement. And this is an example of the fungibility of, of, um, of entanglement. And including this guy over here. Is it useful to think of a single bell pair as a highly quantum mechanical version of an Einstein-Rosen bridge? I don't know. And mostly I won't assume it except at the end for fun. Okay, so let's get now to ER equals EPR and its relationship to Everett and Copenhagen. First of all, what is Copenhagen? I'm, by Copenhagen, I mean the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And what is that? In Copenhagen, you imagine there's a single outside observer who is not part of the system. Very important, they not be part of the system, has control over the system, and can do experiments. Every time an experiment is done, the, um, the state of the system irreversibly, very important, irreversibly collapses the wave function. 
That's Copenhagen. You all know you also you know all know Copenhagen. You use it. It's a brilliant idea and it's very very useful. Okay, but it um, makes an assumption, unrealistic or unfair assumption. The unfair assumption is that there's some sort of Uber observer who uh, himself is not part of the quantum mechanical system. The experiment is not governed by the rules of quantum mechanics, but an extraneous new rule involving collapse. Everett's idea, and the basic thought that Everett had, which is all I really want to take from Everett, is we ought to be able to do better, and we ought to be able to think about systems which have many, many subsystems, any one of which, well, first of all, any one of which would, could, could be thought of as, as an observer. They observe the rest of the system, they observe each other, and all of this should be contained within the rules of a, of a single quantum mechanical uh, um, description. All right, so... Well, Lenny, even in Copenhagen, what yeah. the system is, is fungible. Where you draw your line around... No, I would say when you start... No, no, I would say that when you, when you start to talk that way, you're talking about Everett. So it's a, it's a, it's a fungibility of Everett. <laughs> I, I would say that when you, when you start talking that way, then, you're talking, then you are talking Everett's language. That goes back even to Heisenberg. It probably does. It probably does. Right. 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 But the, the main point is that these are sort of two useful ways. Well, one of them is useful. The other may be deeper and more general. Okay. So now we're going. To, yeah, we're going right there. We're going straight to Wigner's friend. Okay. Everybody know Wigner's friend? Have you, anybody here never heard of Wigner? Oh, thank God. <laughs> uh, all right. There was Wigner's friend. Wigner's friend was an imaginary uh, character, and Wigner's friend was a part of a cat experiment, I think, that Wigner cooked up, and he just asked himself uh, something like the question, supposing my friend goes in, well, a cat begins in a cat state, half dead, half alive, but let's go further than that. Let's just say an enormous superposition of many states. Wigner's friend comes in and observes the cat, the result of that in Copenhagen quantum mechanics is to collapse the cat, the cat wave function. On the other hand, Wigner is waiting outside the room. He can look at Wigner's friend. He can observe Wigner. He can also observe the cat, but uh, these, these lines here are not the important ones. It's the lines connecting the observers. Wigner can measure Wigner's friend, and he can confirm or find out what Wigner's friend saw. Okay? But Wigner, if uh, he wants to, he may think of his friend and the cat as forming a single system. And before he comes in, how would he describe that system? Well, we know how we describe it. We would describe it by saying Wigner, Wigner's friend and the cat are entangled. Then Wigner's friend can come in, and so forth and so on. I introduced Einstein over here at the... Uh, I tell a joke that uh, originally I had him called Schrodinger, but the cat got so scared of Schrodinger that he ran away, and I had to call him Einstein. Never mind. <laughs> Stupid joke. Okay. All right, so let's uh, start with Copenhagen. This is step number one. Wigner's friend observes the cat and collapses the wave function. That's the standard um, Copenhagen picture. Same step in Everett's language. In Everett, I don't know if this is Everett's language or not. This is a language of entanglement. That, uh, that the two interact and enter into a entangled state. This is a typical entangled state, summed over the cats and the Wigner's friend states. Or we may also find, for example, if we wait a little bit and allow them to evolve, They'll stay entangled, but the entanglement wave function here may change to some general unitary matrix. Uh, so a more general version of the maximally entangled state here would involve a unitary matrix here, and that unitary matrix could involve the evolution of the system. But now let's use the fungibility of entanglement to relate this to a question about black holes. We'll take the cat and squeeze him into a uh, black hole. We'll take Wigner's friend, squeeze him into a black hole, and what will we have? We will have two black holes by virtue of the fact that they were entangled. They will have some sort of wormhole. 
presumably by some sort of operations. Uh, originally I said the cat and Wigner's friend can now jump into the black holes. Well, the cat is the black hole and Wigner's friend is the cat hole, so it's the black hole. So we need somebody else. Uh, the cat's friend is Alice. Wigner's friend's friend is uh, Bob. Bob can jump into Wigner's friend. Alice can jump into the cat and meet in the center. Okay? That's, the, uh, that's the idea of going back and forth between basic quantum mechanical ideas and ideas about um, uh, um, wormholes in this case. Another way to describe the entangled state, if you like, if you like um, tensor networks, is to say that the cat and Wigner's friend are connected by a tensor network. The tensor network is just another way of talking about the wormhole. And the one thing that happens is as time goes on, the tensor network gets longer and longer as a function, as a, as a consequence of the natural um, evolution of black holes. The, we, that's not too important in this lecture, but... Um. Okay, now, step number two. Wigner's friend has measured the cat. Now Wigner is going to come into the room and measure his friend. Let's see what happens. We start with the entangled state of the cat and Wigner's friend, and then Wigner comes in, measures and collapses, this is the Copenhagen description, collapses the wave function to one of many of the uh, pieces of the entangled state. And let's say that Wigner's friend does the experiment in the Z basis. The Z basis, we're thinking a bunch of qubits, and some basis makes the measurement. What does that look like? All right, so let's, uh, let's see if we, can, uh, if we can guess what that looks like. Here's it, I will go back to the tensor network description, but it's not important. The cat and Wigner's friend are connected by this large tensor network that represents the wormhole. And now somebody comes and measures Wigner's friend, projects Wigner's friend onto a simple state, a state which is just a product state, makes the measurement in the Z basis, projects Wigner's friend onto a very definite and simple state, and now the two sides are no longer entangled. They're not entangled. Wigner's friend is in a definite state. The cat is in a definite state. Uh, if you're interested at all in complexity, I would tell you if the cat, if this was a, was a very complex uh, um, state, then it will be the cat which inherits all the complexity. But that's okay. That's not important right here. Let's call this snipping. This is a new geometric concept snipping the Einstein-Rosen bridge. Making the experiment at one end of an Einstein-Rosen bridge cuts it, snips it, like with a scissor. According to Copenhagen, the measurement is completely irreversible. The complexity on both sides grows, but whatever happens, as long as the two ends cannot come into contact with each other, they remain unentangled and Alice and Bob can no longer meet behind the horizon. So that's the, uh, that's the Copenhagen picture of what happens in step two. Step two, according to Everett, the cat, Wigner's friend, and Wigner all become entangled in a tripartite entangled state. Remember, they're all in a pure state. The, the, the combination of them are in some pure state. First, Wigner's friend has interacted with the cat, made a wormhole, and now Wigner comes and interacts with the assemblage of both of them, and the whole thing enters into some kind of tripartite entangled state. Tripartite entangled state means what it says, three entangled subsystems in some way. And if ERB really is true, if ER equals ERB is really true, this tripartite entangled state ought to correspond to some kind of wormhole or some kind of Einstein-Rosen bridge. And if so, a meeting in the interior should somehow be possible. Well, now we have a little bit of a contradiction. The Copenhagen way of saying things suggested that when, they, when you snip, it's no longer possible for the two sides to, commute to, uh, to uh, meet in the center. On the other hand, the Everett way seems to suggest some sort of tripartite entangled state, which would involve some kind of Einstein-Rosen bridge, and you should be able to meet in the center. Now, you could stop right here, and you could say, okay, you've demonstrated the contradiction. Einstein. Uh, could you be more explicit about sniffing an Einstein-Rosen bridge? No, 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 no. I don't think so. 
It means you make a measurement at one end. You measure one black hole. You make a complete set of measurements on one black hole. Of course, because they become, uh, become unentangled. If you have an entangled state and you measure one end, you destroy the entanglement. Right. And the space-time will change. Right. That's the, that's the Copenhagen view of it. The Everett way also says the space-time changes, but in a way that corresponds to three subsystems being entangled. Presumably, if we now take Wigner and collapse him into a black hole, then we would have some sort of tripartite uh, wormhole. I don't think that, that's, that's correct. All right, sounds like there's a contradiction. One, one version of thinking about it, you can't send any kind of message through the wormhole. The other way of thinking about it, well, you have some sort of tripartite wormhole. It ought to be possible to send something, uh, not something through it, but something from both sides which meets at the center. Is there a contradiction? The answer is no, but we need to know a little bit more about tripartite entanglement. Okay, so here's, here's the initial, let's reduce it down to a, a qubit problem. The cat, Wigner's friend, Wigner, they're all single qubits. The cat and Wigner's friend, after Wigner's friend measures the cat, they find themselves in an entangled state. Wigner hasn't come into the room yet. Wigner comes into the room, makes a measurement. Here's the way the measurement happens. If he, if he starts in the down state, the zero state. If Wigner finds his friend in the zero state, he stays in the zero state. If Wigner finds his, finds his friend in the one state, he flips to the one state. That constitutes a measurement. Right? A measurement where the apparatus and the observer and everything else is just one qubit. And that takes you to a state, zero, 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 plus one, one, one. It is an entangled state and it has a name. That's called the GHG state. Uh, G stands for Greenberger, Horn, and Zeilinger. This is a sort of generalization of a belt pair to three qubits, and it is entangled, but it's entangled in a rather interesting way. If any party, like for example Wigner, is traced over, the other two, here, let's suppose we trace over Wigner, this will be the resulting density matrix of the cat and Wigner's friend. This is called a separable density matrix. It has the property that it is just the sum of two unentangled density matrices, and it, this kind of density matrix has no entanglement at all between the cat and Wigner's friend. This destruction of the entanglement is a representation of the Copenhagen collapse of the wave function, and that's kind of the end of the story. Okay, but Although no two parties in this GHG state are entangled with each other, each is entangled with the union of the other two. Each is entangled with the union of the other two, and this allows possibilities that Copenhagen would have no way of expressing, not without, not without enlarging the system and um, using, the, uh, using what you said, right. which I call Everett. All right, okay. All right, let's, uh, let's just come back to cats which are made out of lots of qubits. Here's a cat which is made out of lots of qubits. Wigner's friend is made out of lots of qubits. After step one, the cat and Wigner's friend. Incidentally, when I speak of Wigner's friend, I'm speaking about a register that has a memory. When you do a measurement, you have to be able to register the result of the, of the experiment. No experiment is ever done unless it's been registered in quantum mechanics. So when I speak of Wigner's friend, I mean a system which has a memory which is rich, rich enough to encode the result of the measurement of all the qubits of the cat. All right, when that happens, the cat becomes entangled with Wigner's friend, perhaps in the form of a product of bell pairs. Wigner's still over here on the outside. He hasn't done anything yet. But then when Wigner makes his measurement, what happens is the system becomes a product of GHG states. Let me go back a step. I forgot to tell you what this is. This is a little tensor network that just represents the GHG state. It has three legs, comes together at the center, and it's a tensor which simply says that the three, that it's non-zero if all three legs are the same, otherwise, it, uh, otherwise it's zero. So this is an attempt to try to draw uh, some pictures representing the GHG state. After the measurement by Wigner, of Wigner's friend, 
what we just get is a product, a tensor network consisting of a product of these GHZ triplets. Each degree of freedom of the calf has now been measured and is now encoded in one of uh, the qubits of Wigner's register. So that's what uh, a tensor network might look like for Wigner measuring his friend. Now, once this happens, and assuming that we now collapse the three participants into black holes, we can now follow them. And these tensor networks begin to grow. They begin to grow just because wormholes have this growth property. They tend to grow. And in fact, they tend to grow very quickly. That's the increase of their complexity in another language, but I don't want to talk about complexity, so we'll just say they grow, and they do. So after a while, after having done the measurement and collapsed the three participants, you will have some kind of tripartite wormhole, but it will have some obstruction in it. And that obstruction is very interesting. It represents the GHZ character of the measurement or the, or the state that's produced by a measurement. But on the other hand, it now becomes an object. It's an object down deep in the wormhole of a tripartite wormhole system. We can think of it as a physical structure whose properties, in fact, reflect the duality between Copenhagen and Everett. I'll come back to what I meant by that in a moment. All right, let's, uh, there are wormholes or Einstein-Rosen bridges. Don Marolf and his colleagues have studied them at great length, which are smooth. They are the analog of the uh, thermofield double Einstein-Rosen bridge for two particles, for two uh, black holes. They're smooth, they have smooth geometries, and one would expect that if somebody jumped in over here and somebody jumped in over here, they might meet, and you might even expect that three people could meet in the center. Okay. The GHZ brain, whatever it is, is different than this. It's fundamentally different in that no two observers can ever detect each other when they fall in. This, this, and uh, here's what's known, incidentally, just from an information theory point of view, or it's not known, it's suspected by these authors and these authors here, that if you try to distill different kinds of entanglements out of these smooth wormholes, they have very, very little, if any, GHZ entanglement. They don't contain any of these GHZ entangled triplets. On the other hand, this GHZ brain that we constructed by making a measurement in this way is full of, G of GHZ states, lots of them, and we could distill them. This distinction is invariant on the local operations. On operations that take place at the two ends, at the three ends locally, this distinction. So this is a different kind of beast than this. Whatever it is, it's a different kind of thing, but it is a thing. What do we know about it? Well, from the Copenhagen side, we know that no two of them can send messages which will meet in the center. That we've established on the basis of the Copenhagen interpretation. Once the measurement is made, it snips the, it snips the, uh, the Einstein-Rosen bridge, and there's no possibility anymore of meeting at the center. That's presumably true uh, of, uh, well, yes, that should be true. On the other hand, from the Everett point of view, what you create is a three-sided Einstein-Rosen bridge, and each side is entangled with the union of the other two. This presumably means that a message can be sent if Wigner and his friend cooperate in some way. If they can cooperate in some way, then a message can be sent into the interior, this would be the expectation, and if that message was sent in from the other side, they should be able to meet in the center. We do have entanglement between this side and this side. We simply just don't have entanglement between any pair. The suggestion would be that a message can be sent, messages from the two sides can be sent that would meet at the center, but only if Wigner's friend and Wigner can cooperate in some way. More than cooperate, they basically have to reverse the measurement process. How do you do that? So I'll give you one, um, algorithm, a protocol for doing that. 
Einstein is going to help them. Einstein is going to observe Wigner. Remember, Wigner, <laughs> Wigner's friend observed the cat. Wigner observed his friend, and now Einstein is going to come and observe Wigner. Now, if Einstein observes Wigner in the same Z basis that Wigner did his experiment, all he does is confirm. All he does is confirm and get the same answer that Wigner got. What happens is you get a bigger cat state. You get a state 1111 plus 0000. zero, zero, zero. Okay? It's boring. It's not very interesting. What's very interesting is what happens if Einstein does a little trick. He measures Wigner, but in the X basis, in a, in a conjugate basis. Here's what the X basis, 0 and 1 mean the Z basis, sigma Z. Left and right mean the X basis, sigma X. Here's the relation between the Z basis and the X basis with sigma with square root of 2 set equal to 1. Okay, I don't, we don't need any square root. Okay, so let's see what happens. We start in the GHZ state. And now Einstein is going to come along and uh, see what happens. We start in the, G, uh, in the uh, GAG state, and Einstein is going to make a measurement of the last qubit here. This is now our qubit description. Is going to measure the last qubit, but in the x basis. So what we'd like to do is we would like to express this state in the x basis of the last qubit. That's easy to do. Uh, 0 is left plus right, 1 is left minus right. If we combine them together, what we find is left, left, Einstein having measured left, is correlated to 0, 0 plus 1, 1. Ah, this is an entangled state. So by virtue of having measured in the x basis and having detected left, Einstein has pushed this back to the original entangled state between the cat and, um, and Wigner's friend. On the other hand, if he measures right, he still projects this back to an entangled state, but it's the entangled state 0, 0, minus 1, 1. So offhand, Einstein may know which of these two is correct, but nobody else, as far as everybody else is concerned, we don't know whether it's this one or this one. We don't know which entangled state it is. Can Einstein do anything to make sure that you get back to the particular initial um, entangled state that the cat and uh, Wigner's friend began in, namely this one? Yes, Einstein can do something. Here's what he does. If he detects left, he does nothing. Why? Because he's got the right state on the, uh, the other half of the system. If he detects right, he simply acts with Z, with sigma Z, on Wigner's friend. That means he flips the sign of this piece here. He flips the sign of the wave function of Wigner's friend and returns the state the 0, 0, plus 1, 1. In other words, by doing, by taking the classical information that he has after he does the experiment and using it to decide what operation to do, nothing or operating with Z, he inevitably returns Wigner, sorry, the cat and Wigner's friend to the original entangled state. And that's interesting. Somehow, what has Einstein done? He's reversed the measurement that, that, uh, that Wigner did. He's reversed the measurement and basically got back the original entangled state. What does that mean in terms of wormholes and so forth? Well, if we have lots and lots and lots of qubits and we apply exactly the same logic, after Einstein measures Wigner, Wigner and the cat and Wigner's friend will be in one of many, many states. Einstein will know which one, but uh, be in one of many, many states. For example, Einstein might have measured left, 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 left when he, when he uh, measured Wigner. In which case, the cat and Wigner's friend are projected back to the original entangled state that they started in, which we'll assume had a uh, nice wormhole. On the other hand, 
he may find Wigner in some other state. Then there will be entanglement between the two sides, but the entanglement will presumably be of some other kind not consistent with a smooth wormhole. That would be the expectation, that you have a mess in here. A mess in here, if you unitarily ro rotate uh, a state with a nice wormhole, unitarily rotate it on one side, you get a mess. That's known. All right, so there's lots of terms here. Most of them involve states which are bad on the inside. They are not nice wormholes, but Einstein has some classical information. And he can take that classical information and use it to perform a unitary operation on Wigner's friend again. Exactly the same kind of logic will bring the cat and Wigner's friend back to the smooth wormhole state with Wigner being either this, 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 or that, and Einstein knowing it. In fact, Einstein will be uh, uh, entangled with Wigner. So Einstein can use the trick of making the measurement in the X basis to reverse the measurement and to bring the cat and Wigner's friend back to the state where, in fact, somebody can jump in and meet in the center. That's how they would test that this, uh, that this protocol actually worked. That's it for lecture one. What's the result? The result is experiments can be reversed. Oh, well, there's an important point here. The, yeah, let's go back a step. One important point. Everything that Einstein did involved Wigner and his friend and not the cat. So this was a case where by manipulating Wigner's friend and the cat, he made it possible, sorry, Wigner's friend and Wigner, he made it possible for the cat and, Wig and, and the other side to communicate uh, something into the interior. So it's, it's consistent with the GHZ property. Yeah. I have a simple question. So in the case where we have the right amount of entanglement without connectivity, if we... No, no, it's not a question of the amount of entanglement. It's so a question it's of, the, of the, um, the pattern of entanglement. The pattern of yeah. If I wait too long... Yeah. I yeah. still can't right. talk. Yeah, the, that's right. The yeah. So when I say you can jump in and meet, I mean you have to do possibly some very, very complex operation on the two ends before you jump in and meet. But whatever it is, the, the operation is local at the two ends. But is the operational meaning of the hitting the singularity, the fact that in some way it's as if we were jumping into a wormhole on which we've acted? With Maybe. Maybe. I, I don't know. I never understood the singularity. Yeah, it, 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 very likely. But, um, but in general, in order for Alice and Bob to meet in the center, they have to do something difficult. It's not an easy operation. They have to arrange the state just right, and uh, otherwise they'll hit or their... Or jump in very early. Or jump... Well, <laughs> before... Uh, uh, yeah, that's right, which is a complicated thing. Yeah, that's right. Okay, but... Um, Okay, let's come to the second part. Teleportation through a wormhole. Just a fun little idea. Um, can you teleport information through a wormhole? The answer is yes. But let's, uh, so here's, here's what we want to do. We have three systems. Alice has a black hole, Bob has a black hole, and Charlie over here, who is special for some reason or another, Charlie has some third system. The third system, I'm going to assume, has about as much information as either of these two black holes, and it could be a black hole. It doesn't really matter. And what Alice and Bob want to arrange is for Alice to be able to send... Uh, Charlie is next to Alice. Alice wants to send Charlie to Bob. She wants to send the information, the quantum information, of Charlie to Bob. Okay. But the goal is to send Charlie to Bob without sending any information about Charlie through the exterior route. The exterior route means not using the wormhole. Now those who know about uh, quantum information recognize this problem and uh, saying, oh, we, we know exactly what he's going to do next, then you probably do. All right, the answer is that if 
Alice and Bob's black holes are not entangled. No wormhole between them. This is not possible. You can't do this. The only way to send Charlie from Alice to Bob is to send Charlie from Alice to Bob, and somebody halfway through could intercept it and get the quantum information that was intended for Bob. Okay, but if Alice and Bob are highly ent are entangled in a wormhole, or in the highly entangled, if they share entanglement, and the two, the two um, black holes share entanglement, then in fact, you can send information through the wormhole. In particular, you can send Charlie through the, worm, uh, through the wormhole. Um, in a way that I'll show you what the, what the protocol is. I'm not gonna prove that this works. The, uh, if you wanna see the proof of it, it's in a paper I wrote, but, that's, uh, but it, it's more or less obvious that it works. All right, the first thing you do is you take Alice's and Charlie, you take Alice and Charlie and merge them. Think of them as black holes, you can merge them. If Charlie is not a black hole, it just means you throw Charlie into the black hole. Okay. And you make a bigger black hole. Basically with twice the information that Alice had in her black hole to begin with. Then you wait, and the waiting is important. You wait a scrambling time. A scrambling time is the time for the information to get all mixed up in here so that when you look at any subsystem, you can't tell what you really have. Any small subsystem, you can't tell what you really have. You wait a scrambling time, and that's important to the uh, And then Alice makes a complete set of measurements on her black hole, which is now has twice as big as it was, or twice as much information. She makes a complete set of measurements on it, and she gets a random output. In particular, the random output is random relative to the state of Charlie. Why? Because she waited a scrambling time. The scrambling time mixes stuff up badly enough that the, cla that the classical information that Alice gets by doing this experiment is completely uncorrelated to the state of Charlie. Where is Charlie? Charlie is somehow trapped. Oh, and one other point is that by making this experiment, she snips the wormhole. She snips the wormhole. The wormholes are now disconnected. They're not entangled anymore. Where is Charlie? Charlie is somewhere in the bag here. Somewhere in that bag of information there. Now, that doesn't mean Bob can get Charlie out. You would expect Bob can't get Charlie out. Alice has put all of her information, the result of her experiment, she's put it into her notebook. It's classical information in her notebook, and she sends her notebook to Bob. Okay, that takes time. We're not gonna beat the speed of light constraint here. That's not the purpose. But anybody who intercepts the, uh, the, uh, the notebook finds out nothing about Charlie. No information about Charlie. So the information about Charlie is not in that notebook. Somewheres, Charlie is somewhere in here, or if, if he's anywheres. Okay, so now Bob has all of the information in Alice's notebook. What does he do with it? He reads the notebook. He looks at the series of, uh, of bits, and depending on the series of bits, he does a unitary transformation on this end over here. A particular unitary transformation for each possible outcome of the experiment on the left side here. There's an algorithm for what unitary transformation to do on Bob's wormhole here. And if he does those transformations correctly, out pops Charlie from here. Yeah. So how does this differ from quantum teleportation? It is quantum. Oh, it is? Of course. Of course it is. Of course it is. Yeah. So the next part of the story is... Uh, well, okay, then Alice and Bob are standing there, and Alice said, big deal. I know about this. This is called quantum teleportation. We've, uh, we've been doing this for years, except it's in a fancy place, uh, situation with, uh, it's just quantum teleportation. And Bob says, no, yes, yes, it is just quite, he agrees. This is just quantum teleportation, but now let's check whether there really was a wormhole there. We'll jump in, and we'll see if there was a wormhole there. And the answer is, that if there's a wormhole, if, if, uh, if Charlie successfully got to the other side, 
there must have been a wormhole there, and they will discover a wormhole there. If there was no wormhole there, and they have two unentangled black holes to begin with, they will not meet in the center. So the interesting new thing is this correlation with the, let's call it the experiment, of Alice and Bob jumping in and discovering whether they can meet in the center. No meeting, no teleportation. If there's teleportation, it means they can meet. That's what, that's what the new um, correlation is. So I find that interesting. Okay, here's another way to picture the same thing, the same kind of drawing I had in the beginning. Here's Alice, here's Bob, there's Charlie. Uh, Charlie jumps into Alice's black hole. Uh, Alice makes a measurement and sends classical information around the long way. That classical information, if it's intercepted, says nothing whatever about Charlie. If it's not intercepted, Bob uses it and produces Charlie. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the um, teleportation. Now, how much time do we have? Ten minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, two slits in a wormhole. Now I'm going to tell you another kind of entanglement, which usually is not thought of as entanglement, but it is entanglement. And uh, I was surprised when I thought about this, that uh, the, uh, a familiar experiment uh, that I never thought had anything to do with entanglement does have to do with entanglement. But uh, this, uh, first let's talk about just an interference of wave packets. We have a single particle, not enough to make any entanglement. We have one particle and only one particle, but let's put it in some superposition of states, wave packet over here or wave packet over here. A single particle is in a wave function which looks like this. We can allow the wave function to evolve, and if it evolves, perhaps these two can come together. It may be that there will be a node in the wave function, or there may be nodes in the wave function at different places. Here's what you can be guaranteed of. If you look for the particle, it will not appear where there are nodes, for certainty. If you had only one of these functions, it would appear where those nodes would have been. If you have two of them, the particle simply won't arrive where the, where the nodes are. What does this have to do with entanglement? It has nothing to do with entanglement. Uh, this is a problem involving one particle, not two particles. I'll think of it another way. Here's what I'm going to think about. Instead of concentrating on the particles, I want to concentrate on the degrees of freedom contained within a box. A box that happens to contain this wave packet, and another box that happens to contain this wave packet. This same wave function that I described before can be rewritten in another way. It can be rewritten as a wave function saying there is one particle on this side, no particles on this side, minus, just because I had a minus sign in the wave function, no particles on this side, one particle on this side. If I concentrate on the fields, you know, the creation and annihilation operators, within these boxes, all of a sudden I discover my state is a bell state. It's an entangled state of two boxes. Okay. Now I'm going to make a crazy assumption. I'm going to assume that there is a microscopic version of some sort of um, ER equals EPR. If that's true, that tells us there is some sort of primitive one qubit's worth of a Einstein-Rosen bridge connecting the two boxes. Okay, now that may be too crazy for you. It, it, it may well be too crazy for you, but let's pursue it anyway. Let's see what it says. Let's see where it goes. Let's take this two-slit experiment. One way of making a superposition of states would be to send a particle, a beam of particles through two slits, and they come out in a superposition of states. Incidentally, what this means over here, particularly on this side, is it doesn't mean a particle over here and a particle over here. It means a particle over here or a particle over here. In other words, I'm imagining uh, one particle goes through, and it either goes through this slit or it goes through that slit. It comes out over here, it's either here or it's here. It comes out here, it's either here or it's here. In other words, it's in a superposition of states of these two places. If instead of concentrating on a particle, I concentrate on boxes which surround these two regions, what I would say is we end up with a state with an entanglement between a box over here and a box over here. If I then go further, perhaps too far, 
and say that means there's some sort of primitive Einstein-Rosen bridge between them, then after the beam has passed through the two slits, there's an Einstein-Rosen bridge that follows this thing until it hits the screen. The Einstein-Rosen bridge, so to speak, reminds the particles that both bridges were open, that both holes were open. What happens if you close one hole in the same picture? If you close one hole, this, the, the, the possibility of the particle going through is destroyed. The particle, if it goes this way, gets stuck over here. It doesn't go past here. On the other hand, if it goes through the upper hole, it goes through. That means that the Einstein-Rosen bridge that forms because of the entanglement between a box over here and a box over here is always connected to here and is quite, is simply, the point is it's simply different than it was when you opened both boxes. So the Einstein-Rosen bridge is the thing which knows whether both boxes were open or not or whether both uh, slits were open or not. That may be a little bit too crazy. It's beginning to sound uh, too much, for my taste, like uh, hidden variable theory. But nevertheless, if we believe that uh, ER equals EPR can be pushed to the level of single qubits, then this is the kind of picture that uh, might represent a Einstein-Rosen bridge picture of the two-slit experiment. OK, but now can we test? Can we test whether um, there is some notion of connectivity, spatial connectivity between here and here. Here's the experiment that I suggest. We send not one particle through, but many particles through. Each particle that goes through, it either goes through the upper hole or the lower hole, and makes an entangled pair of boxes. A box over here, a box over here. By the time it gets to the box over here, this the box becomes entangled, just from a single particle, it becomes an entangled pair of boxes. Particle here, no particle here, no particle here, a particle here. And we do this many times. We send many, many particles through and we connect, we collect them. We collect them in the boxes. One possibility is that all the particles went through the upper hole. Another possibility is they all went through the lower hole. But mostly, we will find about equal number of particles here and here. And we will find these two subsystems in a highly entangled state. Highly entangled because each one that went through entangled the two boxes. Next, we collapse them into black holes. We have now created, by this interference experiment, we've created two entangled black holes. Alice and Bob are perfectly free to try to jump in and discover whether there's a wormhole between them. And I maintain that they will find a wormhole between them, uh, which can be thought of as the collective effect of a large number of microscopic wormholes, if you like. Um, that's just a, a thing that I find suggestive. I think that's the end of uh, lecture three. What I would like to say about it is that I think there's evidence that the, that the non-localities of quantum mechanics and the non-localities of gravity, which means Einstein-Rosen bridges, may in a sense be the same thing. Uh, at present, it only applies to black holes, but entanglement is fungible, so you can change it from one form to another. Changing it back and forth from one form to another and doing experiments on it um, are uh, the game. I think that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, that's the end of it. So, uh, I would say one more thing. There are many, many other quantum questions that can be translated back and forth. Um, Ning, Ning Bao and his friends have uh, studied um, the meaning in the language of ER equals EPR of things like the no cloning theorem, other things of that nature. And there are many, many correspondences of this form. 
that do suggest a much, to my mind, a much, much deeper connection between gravity and quantum mechanics than just saying we should quantize gravity. Uh, but I'm getting old, so I have crazy ideas. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. Um, are there any further questions? Yes. So it's clear you can make a lot of progress, especially with saying ADS CFD, if you work in the limit where it's a classical Einstein Rosen bridge. What's your view of trying to make progress in understanding this primitive? Yeah, see, I don't, I don't know. That's why I tend to hang my hat on this idea of fungibility and going back and forth. You, you want to you wanna ask, what's the, what's the character of a belt pair, a simple belt pair? What kind of, a, does it have some sort of primitive notion? Well, about the best I can do is say, let's take a lot of them and let's combine a lot of those primitive uh, uh, um, wormholes. And if the whole idea makes sense, then we should collect, we should create a big wormhole. That's the best we know how to do at present. Perhaps there's some notion of quantum geometry which would allow you to uh, to think uh, as I was trying to think in the last part of the lecture here. Okay, but I <laughs> that's. A, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, uh, right. There's, a, there's an object there to study. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I guess my question is uh, because it can be shown that for four party GHD to take the pilot, there does not exist a smooth fault tool. Yeah. Um, how does that interact with the No, no. no. The, the, the expectation is that whatever a GHD brain is, it is not, a, does, it is not smooth. Okay. Right. It's a, it, is, it is almost certainly not a smooth classical geometry. It's some sort of obstruction which is localized somewhere in the wormhole, but I don't think it has a classical geometric description. Uh, and um, what we do know is that when you go from three to four, then I think uh, there's almost a theorem, I think, that, um, that uh, there's no GHZ, four particle GHZ in the, uh, in the smooth wormholes. And, uh, Right. Did that, that answer the question? Yes? Okay, good. Is complexity also fungible in some way? What's that? Is complexity also fungible in the sense that it's Oh, is complexity fungible? <laughs> Ooh. It's not. I don't think so, but uh, I didn't think so. It seems hard because it's. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think it's changing. Yeah. I'm not sure. You caught me by surprise. I never thought about that. Is complexity fungible? I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll email you. <laughs> so, do you expect that? Um, I understand there are no experimental predictions. No. No, 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 no. I, I think I think all predictions from outside the black holes will be absolutely identical to what you would expect from entanglement. Even if you rotate the black holes around each other? Yeah, I don't think you're gonna. I, I, my, uh, um, I would be very perturbed if uh, somebody found an experiment. Uh, no, yeah, no, I think any experiment that you can do from outside the black holes should be consistent and should give the same answer as just saying they're entangled. Yeah, it's only, the only new thing is if you allow your experimenters to jump in and uh, ask whether they find each other or not, then there are correlations between whether the black holes are entangled and whether they can find each other or not. That's the new kind of thing that, uh, that's there. What's that? Uh, as they evaporate, particles go off. They're entangled with the black hole. And so Einstein Rosen bridges form between, um, between the evaporating black hole and the entangled particles that go out. At the end of the day, all you have is particles. 
but the particles are entangled. The first half of the particles are highly entangled with the second half of the particles. And I believe you should imagine there's an Einstein-Rosen bridge with the particles just being the mouths of the, uh, the many mouths of the, uh, the Einstein-Rosen bridge. So. You can't detect the Einstein. Oh, yes, you can. Well, no, no, you can't if you stay outside. But what you can do, again, it always comes back to the same thing. You've got to commit suicide. But, um, but, uh, but what you can do is you can collect those entangled particles, collapse them back into the black holes, and then jump in and see whether you can find each other. So it's always the same game. You use this fungibility to turn things into black holes and then do the experiment of seeing whether you can find each other inside. That, uh, would you call the, imagine uh, the set of geometry, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. would you call the slice that goes from one worm line to another, one of these uh, worm holes? Yes. You would? I think so, yeah. But in this context, it's at some point it ends? Not, some, not easy for somebody to make. But you would call it of the same nature as the black hole? Even yes, absolutely. It's clear what's entangled with what in this case. Well, the left, uh, the left side, the left uh, causal patch the left is entangled side. with the no, right no, causal no, patch. No, black hole, but it doesn't open up in the black hole. But in that context, could you imagine an experiment if at some point it ends, the decider uh, becomes a for W or something? Oh. And then you could test whether oh. or not these things are. I think you better get standard answers. But somehow, you know, I mean, you presumably. You've fallen in by virtue of the end of this. Okay, but in that case, you do. I think we do expect that they can find each other because the inflation has stopped. Right. So we expect to be able to discover each other. Yeah. So long as they're entangled appropriately. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I don't think this is an honest example of the same thing. I think this is just an example of the classical end of, uh, uh, end of inflation. Right, but if you right. were in a state where they were not particularly entangled and inflation, you might expect something nasty in between. Oh yeah, you expect something nasty in between. There yes. Are two different right. Results. Right. Uh, right. Right. But yes, I think the pseudo space uh, is a, a case of this. Uh, right. And you can you can jump into the uh, region in between from both yeah, sides. Right. So, so and at that point it's the same, but somehow yeah, because of yeah. the absence of a singularity at that right. line on the top, right. somehow we have right. a different way to look. Yeah. Uh -huh. Good. Well, let's thank Buddy again. Thank you.